Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special Wednesday, another special Wednesday. Uh, my Amazon guy live podcast. I've got my my friend here, Dan Peskors, um, uh, joining us, who is a uh, ingenious uh, product uh, researcher and designer. Um, Dan, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Pumped. <laughs> <laughs> Dan and I, uh, we've been talking about doing this podcast for a long time, um, and uh, we finally found a date, and uh, we're both happy to be here and answer product research questions, brand questions, uh, any other questions uh, that you might have as well. Um, but let's uh, let's learn a, minute, a little bit more. Uh, Dan, tell us about yourself. Yeah, um, I've been in the e-commerce space for a number of years. I've done everything from uh, launch brands off of Amazon, doing Shopify, had a bunch of successful Kickstarters in the past, uh, got into Amazon FBA about four years ago, um, actually purchased an FBA business and went through that process uh, and have been growing that brand and have actually launched three additional brands and uh, have quit my day job and have been doing this uh, full time for a while now uh, and everything's going great. So um yeah, I think the next thing that I'm going to start, which I'm pretty excited about, is uh, an agency. It's going to be called Mad. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's my Amazon uh, daddy. I don't know if you know that. Uh, no, I'm just screwing we, me. We did, a, we did a shirt swap yeah. today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm not starting an agency. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's me. I love, uh, I love selling online. Um, love coming up with new product ideas, new brands, uh, doing the product research, um, figuring out the keyword sets and, and finding these niches because people talk about that there's a lot of saturation right now and there is, but there's tons of opportunity. So um, you just got to kind of know where to look and, and how to go about it methodically. So it's, uh, it's always a good time to launch on Amazon. That's uh, what we always say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, uh, you know, We'll, we'll answer your questions, as I mentioned, uh, as, as they come in, but uh, we do have some agenda items as far as uh, what we wanted to discuss and make sure that we're adding value um, in, in this, uh, this special podcast today. Um, so, so as Dan mentioned, you know, he's had Kickstarter launches and, and uh, lots of brand launches. So, so one thing people always ask us, um, uh, Dan, uh, I think we've talked about this before, you and I, but um, how often when, uh, you get to the point where you're, you're manufacturing, um, and it's, uh, the products are on the way to Amazon, what's like the success rate? I know that you have a really high success rate, but have you ever had any duds? Um, I wouldn't say that we, we haven't had any duds, but I have had products that I didn't time well, and they were more seasonal than I would like them to be. So they become a dud pretty quickly. And I'm hoping that once the weather changes, that we'll be able to revive those. But so I would say in, in short, no duds, but poor timing for seasonal items. And people say, you know, oh, seasonal is tricky. It is tricky because if you have any sort of production delay, you're basically waiting a whole nother year and you're sitting on that and paying for storage fees and, and you know, maybe your, your uh, IPI score on Amazon is going down because you have inventory there. You have to liquidate. There's a lot of things that go into it. So, um, so uh, I would say if I'm being honest about it, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> no duds, but we've had a seasonal dud. So we'll go, we'll go with that as the answer. But good. That's a good term to segue off of, you know, um, uh, when, when you're doing product research, uh, yourself or any other seller out there, um, how how much of your, um, you know, I'm going to launch this, do you take into account for seasonality? Is it better to pick an evergreen product? Uh, I mean, I, you would think, right? Or Yeah, I mean, we, we tried to pick evergreen products, but there's always going to be some sort of seasonality associated with the product. So we have we have a, a suite of products that actually do really well during Q1. Uh, it's kind mm -hmm. of a New Year's resolution type product. Mm -hmm. And our big uh, period of sales is from um, January kind of peaking in March. 
Um, but they do sell throughout the rest of the year and they still have a nice boost during the holidays. So I would say you don't have to be afraid of seasonality when it comes to sales volume. You have to worry about things that are so specific seasonally, like for a particular holiday that if you don't get in at the right time and, and plan your inventory correctly, you're just really in trouble. Like Halloween costumes, that's really scary to me. Like I saw my wife returning a couple of costumes last week for my son who didn't want to wear Halloween costumes this year because he's little. And I'm thinking about those sellers, like how many times is this happening to them right now? <laughs> and it just, it, it gave me anxiety. So, um, so I, I would say, I would say some very seasonal variability is fine. And if you group your, your, your products into different seasons, then you will will maintain consistent sales. So I have some that are really well, do really well in Q1. I have some that do really well in the summer. I have some that do really well in the winter. And, you know, I don't really plan that product mix, but I like having a lot of variety so that the business is kind of stable throughout the year. Um, and I do try to avoid like what I would consider to be like very date specific seasonal type things because it's just really hard to manage. Yeah, I agree there. Um, especially things that, again, like you said, if if manufacturing or, or shipping or logistics is tied back and you miss the season, you're <laughs> you're holding the bag for, for a year. Yep. Um, so uh, going off of, you know, we talked about seasonality a little bit. Um, let's, let's get into, um, you know, Okay, uh, you you've determined a product that you're going to launch. Um, do do you uh, when you're launching, you know, uh, settling on a product idea or whatever? Do you go as far as to um, designing them to to patent them that sort of thing? That's a question we always get asked: is like, is it worth patenting my item? Um, that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, we can. Yeah, we can talk about that. So. Uh... You know, after we've done our, our research, you know, it always starts with keywords, right? So yeah. whether you find the product idea first and look at the keywords or you generate the product idea from the keywords, it starts there. So if you if you if you feel good about both the product idea and the keyword, um, we work on kind of doing some designs that are rough and ready, right? Like uh, enough information, but maybe not full blown CADs. We want to go and get quotes. Uh, from multiple suppliers. We, we look on Alibaba and find people um, yeah. and reach out to them. And we've had a lot of success there. We've used sourcing agents, uh, but we, we typically just do it ourselves. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, won't, we don't need to get into that process. That's a whole nother animal. But um, <laughs> it, the, you know, we get, quote back, get quotes back. And the way that we look at, about it, look at it is, is we look at three things. We look at desirability, which is search volume. Are people looking for this? feasibility can you actually make the thing right because sometimes you come up with ideas and it's like well this can't actually be made like it's a cool idea but there's a reason it doesn't exist because it's not possible to manufacture these things okay. or to make it in the way that you think yeah. and then there's viability which is the financial piece can you make money off of this product can you get it manufactured at a price point that meets your margin requirements so those are the three things desirability feasibility viability um, and so as we go through our process, we're always asking those questions. Well, is this affecting our viability? Is this affecting the desirability? Is this affecting the feasibility? And once we answer, you know, yes to all those questions that it meets our criteria, we kind of like green light it. And it's like, mm -hmm. we're moving forward with this one. So to answer your question about patents is once we have the design done, um, we, go into manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, if we have to pull molds, we get molds pulled, we get samples, we do the whole thing, photography, videography, listing, copywriting, getting ready for launch, we launch with everything done, everything optimized from day one, we don't add stuff on later. But patents, we don't submit patent applications until after we see a little bit of sales history. Okay. Yeah. Because if it's a dud, that could be a lot of money and time and effort out the door. Um, whereas, you know, from I, I believe and I'm not, you know, this isn't legal advice or anything like this. Yeah. But I <laughs> you, you have until like 
a year after the first date of in-commerce use for a product to file your patent. Um, so we give it, you know, four to eight weeks and see how it performs. And then we go ahead and do our patent applications then. And, you know, we do, um, both design and utility patents, depending on what the product is, but design a lot of times, um, you got to be careful there because if you get too detailed, someone can just make a quick change to the product and then yeah. they can avoid that design patent. So you got to kind of be general about those or do multiple multiple design patent filings for different aspects of the product so that you get a little bit more coverage. And if someone does rip it off or make a change, you might have a leg to stand on with getting, you know, those listings or that seller removed um, on Amazon. So, and this is the other difference too. When you talk with lawyers, they're like, well, this isn't going to be very dependable or defendable. And the reality is you're not really taking legal action. You're asking Amazon to remove somebody for infringement. Yeah. And Amazon isn't really digging into the legal details. They're not passing judgment. They're not, um, what's the right term? Adjudicating. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not judge, jury, and execute. I mean, they are kind of like judge, jury, and executioner, I guess. And so, well, like, it's, it, it's it's their platform. It's their rules, essentially. You know, right. so, um, like you're saying, um, it's it's another way to prevent hijackers and that sort of thing. That's one thing that you know we don't mess around with here. Um, obviously, we have our trademark services and and uh, that sort of thing, but don't do any patent stuff because that's just a whole another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, and think about this, like if, if you're trying to grow a business and you want to sell it, uh, the buyers, regardless of whether they're an aggregator or an individual, wants a defendable product set. They want to moat yep. around this. And that can be barrier to entry. That could be legal, like with patents and trademarks. So all this can add up to a higher multiple. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a product that's selling really well and you can see that in the first four to eight months and you could potentially defend it a little bit with a patent. It yeah, pays, yeah. it could pay for itself in like a week. So sure. once we see that, we green light it and we go ahead and, and patent. We try to patent every single product. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them you just can't, but you know, yeah. if, even if, even if there's a likelihood and the lawyer's like, I don't really know if you're gonna be able to defend this, we just do it anyway. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good. I, I didn't know you guys did every product. That's crazy. Um, well, the ones that we can, right? So there, yeah. there are, you know, I would say across all of our products, we probably only have 60% of them in process. So, you know, some of them you just can't, like, they're just like, yeah. you're wasting your money if you try to do this. It's not going to get granted. So, um, yeah, we, we, we do it when we can, I guess is the way to, to put it. Awesome. All right. We got a couple new members. Thank you, Rasvin and Brian. Thank you for becoming a member. Crazy man's uh, crazy Marlin says, "Sup guys, sup crazy <laughs> Marlin." And then of course Kevin's here. Uh, good evening from Lakeland, Florida. That's ingrained in my head. Thank you, Kevin, for always uh, showing up. And uh, crazy Marlin says, "Thank you for your time." Um, and we'll get to some questions here in just a moment. I wanted to uh, continue on what we we're discussing with Dan uh, Pescors here, and. Uh, one thing that uh, Dan, uh, you know, always talks about and has brought up to me before is, uh, you know, it, it's very important. You you found your product, you're manufacturing, um, or maybe you're you're ready to manufacture. You've got it all nailed down, like we talked about. But a lot of people forget a really important part. And and um, Dan, go ahead and tell us what that part is. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of important parts. The, 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 the thing we talked about right before uh, we went live. Oh, brand names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brand names. Okay. So <laughs> brand names are wild, right? So there's a lot of mistakes that people make with brand names. Um, this is true for domestic sellers as well as international sellers. Some of the most glaring ones are, are, are international sellers just because there's that language disconnect there. And so you see some pretty crazy stuff when it comes to brand names. But in, the, but, but in reality, even, you know, uh, people in the, uh, in the U.S. Uh, or English speaking countries make a lot of mistakes when it comes to brand names, too, because once you, once you set your brand name, you're kind, you're kind of there. And 
there's not it, it, it's a lot of money and time and effort to to reset the brand name thing so what i was going to do if it's okay is maybe spend a couple of minutes sharing with everyone our brand name selection steps and how we go about creating a new brand name the things that we look at and the process and the tools that we use to do this um it's nothing proprietary it's just something that we came up with that we use that's been very effective because what we have a lot of people say is how did you get that brand name how much did you pay for that domain and the reality is we probably paid at most $19 for the domain because that's the way that we do our search. <laughs> but there's a process to find these things, right? They exist. They're out there. So why don't I share my screen real quick if you want me to walk through this? Yeah, go ahead. Share your screen. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, I think we're shared. Oh, there we go. Uh, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, so this isn't pretty. Let me blow this up a little for you so that everybody can read this. You can screenshot it if you want. Uh, eh, too much. Too much. <laughs> about, nah. Let's go to 14. And then. Yeah, that's that's good. We can see it. That's all good. Yeah, you guys can see it. Okay, let me do this. Okay. So when we're thinking about a brand name, you can think about kind of what product category you're in or the product type, right? Is this a, is this an outdoor brand? Is this a home goods brand? And think about some of those things that you, you see and other brand names that are in those category. Like if we're doing home goods, like West Elm or, uh, you know, country cottage or something. And you're like, yeah, that that's a nice generic, uh, home goods brand name, because I might come up with other products that fit under this brand, but I don't know what they are yet. So you don't want to go too specific, uh, but you want it to sound appropriate. So what, what I do is I go through and I pick and just kind of brainstorm two categories of words that are general, but fit the vibe of the brand. So I'm going to talk about a home goods brand. And if you look here on the left, I've got two columns and it just says first words, and outdoor words. And I thought started thinking like, okay, for home goods, I want to do like names of trees and seasons and flowers and just words like that. And in the next uh, column, I wanted to do outdoor words like hollow and valley and breeze and cottage and cabin and lakes and coasts and things like this. So once you have a list and this doesn't have to be perfect, right? Just put whatever you want in there. Just words that you like that think that you think you have the that that they have a vibe about them. And then what I do is I take those two columns and I concatenate them. And that's a fancy way of saying add them all together and make possible brand names out of them. And I use a tool um, that's listed right here um, that uh, I've been using for years, and I can't. Let me pop over to another tab here real quick. So uh, this is the tool. Uh, it's from a brand called Found, but they have this keyword uh, PPC concatenation tool, which this thing's awesome. It's free. You should use it. I use it for PPC stuff or anything. So basically, I just put these two columns in here, and I choose broad match, and I hit concatenate, and it adds all those words together in this nice, beautiful, long list of possible brand names. So I've got 208 possible brand names. Some of them I'm going to like, some of them I'm not going to like. Doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about that. So basically, go ahead and copy this list and put it back in your spreadsheet. Um, and then add the .com to it. So you can okay. use a function to basically add it together. And then you get this list right here of possible domains. <laughs> so then you take those domains and you copy them and you put them into GoDaddy into you can you can upload a whole bulk list of domains up to 2000 domains. Now you have to be signed in. So you got to have a yeah. GoDaddy account. You got to sign in and then you search for the domains. And then it will pull up a list of the domains and I sort them by price. <laughs> and I'm down to 471 out of that original 800 and something domain. So already we're cut in half. 
because I'm not going to start a brand that doesn't have a domain available for it, a .com, yeah. right? And so now my list is already down to 471. And then I can go ahead and export this and sort it by price. And I don't want to pay more than $20 for my domain. So that we're probably down to, I don't know, a list of 100 or 200 potential domains, um, maybe less at that point. So once you have that list of 100 or 200 domains, that's when, you know, I, I, I go ahead and, and create what's called like a, a home goods brand shortlist. And this is me just combing through that 100 or 200. It only takes a couple of minutes. You think, oh, that's a lot. It's not that many. So you just read them and you're like, do I like it? Yes or no. Uh, but also there's other things that you need to look at. Yeah. Is it trademarked. And this is one that's overlooked a lot. What is the character count of the brand name? So in your Amazon title, you're limited to a certain number of characters. So you might find a really cool brand name, but it might be 30 characters long. And you're wasting <laughs> so much SEO juice uh, in your title by having this super long brand name and you're just hurting yourself. So I sort it by character count. And it doesn't mean that the short ones are the best ones. It just means that if, if I had to choose between two and everything was equal, I would choose the one with a shorter character count. And you may cut it off. You might just be like, okay, I'm not doing, my cutoff is I don't want my brand name to be more than 15 characters. So when I looked at the ones that I liked and I realized that there were only 15, you know, no more than 15 characters, I'm down to 44 options. So you see the list is getting shorter. Then I take the time to go and look at the trademarks. This is manual, but remember, I'm only down to 44, so it doesn't take that long. So you can go to the, the trademark registry and type in the name and just say, is it, you know, is it trademark? Yes, no. Even if it is, is there a conflict that you can see? Yes. Is it, is there a weird conflict? You know, I, I just kind of put notes in here and I start mm -hmm. to narrow my list down even further. And then at that point, I may create a column here that says, um, you know, continue process or something like that. And I'll select them. And then what I do for those ones is I do two things. One, Google it. Just Google the name. Google Rest Elm. Because <laughs> you might come up with something crazy. Rest Elm is a motel that's in, um, you know, Paducah, Kentucky, that eight people got murdered in in 1970, <laughs> right? Or something, <laughs> something crazy like that, right? And you're like, ooh, okay, I don't want to do that. That I don't want my brand associated with that. And, and so from like an SEO perspective and a ranking perspective and just a brand perspective, like what are you up against? So we have a brand name that is also the name of a band, like a local band in Florida. And it's like, eh, I'm not worried about that, right? Like, I don't care. But if that local band had done something crazy and there was a bunch of negative news around it, then I might not want to have selected that brand name. So Google it and then also look to see if the social handles are available. Is the Instagram handle available? Is the Twitter handle available? Is the Facebook page available? Look at all those things and you can make uh, categories for these. And your list is going to get really short real quick. But at the end of the day, you're going to have some really good options to choose from that you know aren't trademarked, that the social handles are available, that there's nothing negative on Google or search engine results about it, that the .com is available for $20 and it has a short character count. So that's how we go about selecting our brands. Um, and at the point, if we're choosing between a few at the end, we just ask our friends and family, which one of these do you like for this product? And eventually we'll get a little bit of consensus or you just pick one that sounds good. Like hollowelm.com, you know, like Lake Elm, Rest Elm, like these are great names and these are all available for $19 and they're short, like Lake Willow, River Tulip, like they don't mean anything necessarily, but this is the process. So um, wanted to share that with you guys and hopefully that helps as you're, you know, trying to figure out how to go through your brand selection process. Yeah. And this is probably the most comprehensive how to pick a brand uh, tutorial on YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought about doing a YouTube video for it and I was like, I just not, I'm not even going to get in that world. I'll just share it with Jason. So we'll just, uh, this is where it lives.
this uh th- that's a it's amazing um i have never seen I, i've heard how certain people come up with brand names a lot of times <laughs> like i mean steven i think steven comes up with them uh he names them after his kids and stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, <laughs> um that that the in-depthness of that and um going through all those steps because the worst thing that could happen is you could settle on something, say your normal process is only like maybe, uh, you know, half those steps or whatever. And then you're like, okay, we got the trademark. And then you go on the Facebook and it's taken, you know, yep. like, and then you have to have your brand name, like dash one or something like that. And the, you, your, your social presence is gone at that point. I mean, yep. it's just, it's really, really smart. And then a lot of those names that were available there, they sound like real brand names. Like, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I can see that, you know, West Elm or or whatever that yeah. was. Yeah, it exactly. Could, that it could be a towel company. It could be mm-hmm. a, uh, they could sell bathroom uh, mirrors. You know, like all kinds of stuff. Like, so that 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 was that was great, man. Um, that's that's one thing. Uh, just to to continue on, you know, uh, what you said at the beginning of your presentation is, uh, we'll see we'll see these accounts or clients or uh, whoever where they have uh, an established brand and, you know, they sell, let's say they sell pet food or something like that. Right. And the brand is good. It's pet food related. If you hear the brand name, it sounds like it's a pet food brand. Um, But then they want to launch, you know, camera equipment and they're like, Oh yeah, we'll just put it under the same brand. And you're like, "Mm, it doesn't sound like, camera accessories <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so uh, it's one thing is very important on amazon branding um it, again like you said in the beginning um you stand out uh, those those shorter relevant brand titles compared to you know who jaiwa you know and all these other random brand names and stuff um yeah there's there's credibility there's instant credibility there right like i mean uh, uh, there's a lot of times people say, oh, this niche is saturated um, or uh, I'm, I'm, you know, my my supplier is just going to launch the same product at a lower price and all these things. And and we've seen that happen. Right. We've been first to market with products and uh, we have, you know, and we're waiting on the patent. And so we have 20, you know, new competitors that have popped up because it's not a super defendable product. Yeah, but they can't compete. We're still the number one seller. We're priced ten dollars more than them, and it's because our brand looks legit. The brand's legit. The listing's legit. The copywriting's professional. Um, it's done here in the states, you know. But it, you know, and this goes for any geography that you're in. It has to look native and and be culturally appropriate for who you're trying to sell to to really stick that first position if there's competition involved so yeah you know a a lot of people shy away from that and we don't because we just know that even if there's 20 new sellers they can't they can't compete with us and they don't and we've seen that play out multiple times have you ever had to compete with amazon basics yet no, no, we, we avoid that. Uh, and they may come for us at some point, but luckily, uh, luckily we haven't. Although most of the time their listings aren't that great, you know, no, no they're terrible. They're terrible, but yeah. obviously, I mean, everyone can believe what they want to believe, but they do something to make those listings. They got like choice badges. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazon special brand. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I had a, I had a, a coaching call with some, some poor guy that, he had an established product, been selling it for three years. Um, and Amazon literally copied his product a couple months ago. And he, he, they're like number one organically on all yeah. his keywords and all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. Like, like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, and they're like $18 cheaper than he is. They're definitely not making any money on the product, you know, so. But um yeah, a little off topic there. Um, let's let's grab some questions and then we'll get uh, into a few more uh, topics here. Sure. Um, these might not or may not may or may not be product launch or brand related, but you've been around the space that so you can uh, you can. Uh, yeah, I can. I can answer this, here. right? And uh, Crazy says, are you guys constantly changing your 
uh, Amazon storefront, or sorry, your Amazon store name every time you launch a newer product, or do you keep your Amazon store name vague so you can sell anything? It's a good question. The difference between a store name and a and a brand name. You want to take that one, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So so we have just one. To be clear, we have just one Amazon account, which is set up under our LLC. And then within that, you can get brand registry for multiple brands. And once you have that brand registry, you can do specific storefronts for each brand. So we only have one Amazon account, but we have four brands that live underneath that. So um, we don't change our Amazon store names. We might add another brand, which would be a unique Amazon or excuse me, a, a unique Amazon storefront under a new brand name with products that are under that brand. But um, yeah, we, we don't change it. Now, we do keep it vague within that brand. Like if we, we have a home goods brand, we have like a, a, like a pool and hot tub brand, we have, a, you know, like a, like a meal and like food brand. So like, you're not going to find, I don't think doing a completely generic name is a good idea because you want it to relate to the product. Cause I think that that really helps with not only brand recognition, uh, but also with legitimacy of the brand and the platform. Uh, but you can keep it general where, you know, maybe you're selling multiple different types of home goods or different things for your backyard and, you know, they can all live under that. So, um, so vague, Yes, but still category specific. So like that whole West Elm, like what does West Elm mean? It doesn't mean anything. It is vague, but it sounds like a home goods brand. So that's good for home goods. So just to kind of demonstrate for everybody in case um, anybody's a little lost here, uh, what Crazy Marlin's kind of talking about here is this is the brand. I just picked some random product. Uh, th this is the brand, Bumkey. As we're talking about funny brand names. <laughs> Good that they only have five characters, but bad because it means absolutely nothing and doesn't help them out at all. So uh, bomb key. Um, and then this is the seller that's selling. This is be your seller central display name. Um, and you can change your seller central display name as long as it's not already taken. So if you created your account a long time ago um, and it says like, you know, crazy Marlins Amazon account or something like that, you can change it to, as, as Dan was mentioning, something more relevant to, uh, again, this is outdoor barbecue. So a lot of times I'll see people um, it use, uh, you know, like in this space, it would be like ultimate outdoor barbecue store or something like that, you know, um, so that it's relevant. Obviously, you want to make sure it's not a trademark name, but um, yeah. So good question. Good question there, Marlon. Let's uh, remove this. And let's go. I forgot to get to the first question here. Okay. Hamza says, uh, hey, so I made a dummy listing through Flatfile with 12 to 15 variations, but I've noticed that in the back end they show together, but on Amazon page, they do not show together. It's a size color variation. Um, this could be a number of troubleshooting issues as far as uh, it's not a valid variation theme in that particular category would be my guess. It's a, you're doing dual variation but uh, you could have a, a, a suppression on the parent where it's showing in the back end as it is, uh, but it's not fully linked on the PDP. You got anything on that one, Dan? <laughs> no, I rely on you and your team. For <laughs> yeah, that is not my forte. Dan's like, uh, no parentage is no, <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Jason can help you. Yeah. Uh, one more here from Hamza it says, our inventory is on the way. Should we wait to have the inventory checked in or should... A ticket Amazon now. I'm I'm guessing he's saying in relation to a launch, uh, Dan. Well, yeah, or relation to the last question. Um, oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Ticket them now. Get it. Get that. Get the get that stuff fixed as quickly as possible prior to launch. Um, Take all of your children and make sure the the offer, the release, and the launch date are set back. If you don't know how to do that in a flat file, um, you can just go into your uh, manage inventory if they are editable. And I'll go into one real quick on Steven's account. Um, and last time we tried to demonstrate this, uh, it was a, a clothing item and a clo clothing doesn't have, uh, them in the correct, the normal spots as every mm -hmm. other list. Yeah. Does. Sometimes they're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so in your offer, um, you want to, uh, set your, uh, where is it? It's up, it is. up there. Yeah. Release date. 
So you're going to set the in the far whatever. You can always bring it back. And then on your um, your product details. Oh, this one's going to give me a weird thing too. Yeah, it's not on this one. This I think this is... Of course, every time I try and demonstrate this, <laughs> let me find a normal item. <laughs> um, they, yeah, I just they, scroll through all the tabs and look for anything that says like release date and put it. Yeah, there's like three different ones and just put them all out. I just put them at the end of the year. Like, yeah, I, most products have the three of them. There's some like books and cards that have one. Um, clothing has two, and it depends what cat what subcategory of clothing you're in. Uh, they're they're always on the offer and then the other one's somewhere in one of those tabs like dan mentioned um easiest thing to do is just do it on the flat file there's columns for all of that so all right uh joe says listing has 2500 reviews and just dropped from 4.5 to 4 star small variation size weighing me down possible to split my reviews to show my child is and still under one parent group um so he's getting bad reviews on his small um, uh, so for me, I have what I've found with Amazon when it comes to large amounts of reviews uh, with variants is that when you get to a certain review count, they will split them out, but I don't think it's something you can control. So I had a product that has four variations. And once I got up around 10,000 reviews, they split out all the reviews separately for each, uh, variation. But until then, I mean, there was no way for me to select it. So, J you know, Jason, you would know more about that mean, but that's that's the only experience I've had with splitting out child variation review. Did they, did they really separate your reviews to individual and the children, but the parentage is still together? Uh, I don't know if the parentage is together or not, but the individual, I mean, you know which ones I'm talking about. So like yeah. The, they, uh, yeah, they did. It was probably like six months ago. Each color has its own review count. And the reviews that you see, like if you look at the pictures in the reviews, they're all for that, for that, uh, huh. for that. But the, the new launch has, I think, uh, only a certain amount of reviews from one of the variations. Because, you know, when you launch a variation, it will show all the reviews from the other ones. Yeah. And so it is showing the reviews from the other ones, but not from all of them, just from one of them. And I don't know why that is, but we should be able to. Um, I'll let. I'll let the Sorry, Joe. Know. I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> I'll let the Toms know. Uh, we, we should be able to, to see if we can get those merged back. But um, I think this is more of a he's getting weighed down because of the, he's below 4.3 now. So uh, there's two options here, Joe. Um, break the parentage uh, if this has good velocity. Uh, one's going to have the small one's going to have worse reviews. Um, but you can't you can't keep the the. Uh, I think what you're trying to do is keep them grouped without reviews uh, unless, you know, something like Dan's situation happened here. Uh, but uh, the reviews naturally merge um, to the parent. Um, but I have to investigate on see what uh, what's going on with uh, Dan's parentage. Because I've never seen him forcefully break them apart. Uh, I think it's some sort of maybe. Uh, usually when this happens, Dan, is some contribution in like UK or Germany or something like that is screwing something up. And then we yeah. just have to like, uh, we have to ticket them and and uh, and get everything merged back together. Uh, oh, I'll, here, I'll, there's more I'll to this question. To you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Small will show 300 reviews at four star, but medium will show uh, 900 at 4.5 star. It sounds like your medium is more popular anyways. Um. Is there any way to change these? Uh, this is tough because your small is bringing in traffic to the medium as well in the parentage because people are going, oh, I might as well get the medium. I got an idea. I don't know if this is gray hat or black hat or not. <laughs> you, could, you could break all of them out, right? Into individual categories. Um, sell through your inventory in small and create a new ASIN for small and then reparentage all of them after that's created. And that would start over from zero reviews. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, as if he if he modifies and fixes the issues that's happening with the small, we got to figure right. out what. Yeah, why, if, why you're getting those negative reviews? Yeah, yeah. If people are returning the small because well, you know I don't know what what it is. Let's just say it's towels. Uh, you know the small. Uh, uh, you know, frayed in the washing machine and the medium's not or something. Um, unless you fix the physical defect of the product, then um, if it's something that's not a defect, it's just a consumer uh, reason, which. It's got to be pretty legit if they're leaving bad reviews because people don't like to re leave reviews. They like to leave bad reviews uh, if they're mad about something. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I would figure out if there's a product um, issue that you can fix or something in the copy that you can add that would, you know, you know, hey, this is make sure, you know, it's showing the dimensions in one of the secondary images. Maybe people don't realize how small it is, you know, um, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Crazy says, uh, Dan, I was driving when you explained how to come up with your brand names. Do you have a quick PDF or slide that you can share so I can try your technique? It was a brilliant idea. You you should have pulled over. <laughs> and <t> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can share, uh, my example spreadsheet, uh, with you, Jason. Uh, I don't know after the recording is done, if there's a way to add an attachment to it or, um, um I don't, I don't know. We can do this. We can do this a couple ways. I could make a, I could have my team make a graphic for you if you want. Um, and then you can post it since it's your thing. Uh, you can post it on your LinkedIn and then I can, uh, share it, okay. uh, and have Steven share it. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. We'll we'll make okay. sure. We'll I just want to make sure. sure you. I want to make sure you get credit for it. <laughs> Thanks. <You're> so thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll put some we'll put something together that has a, a couple of slides or something on on how to go through the process. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, or you can just like I said, you can just um, uh, we have the video. I can just have uh, Paul or one of my graphic guys just make a slideshow or something for you, so you yeah, don't have cool. to do any work. <laughs> yeah, great. Fabi says, "Cool." Did not know you can do that. I think that's regarding the uh, the brand store uh, brand or seller central names. Uh, he's got says, says, can the customer see all the brands you have? Uh, yes, but it, to navigate there, they have to be kind of, uh, you know, really trying to do that. Um, it's not something that Amazon really promotes because most brands are pretty disparate in terms of their attraction to consumers. So I would say, yeah, but they have to they have to be looking for it. Yeah, there's some tools out here that do this. I, I can't remember any of them. They're kind of like Chrome extensions and stuff like that. But the old school manual way of doing this to find out uh, the brands is, again, go to the seller. And um, in Steven's podcast today, they had a, a, a cool uh, topic. If you go to the seller storefront at the top left here, the, uh, the first product, well, they only have one product. <laughs> The, uh, the first product is uh, the top selling product. Let's find a, another example here. Let's go to this person's uh, storefront here. Oh, yeah. And, they got a bunch of brands. Yeah. So they're top seller. And now this guy looks like a reseller or a wholesale arbitrage. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily his brands, or, but um, these are the, you know, the top items that they're selling here. Uh, it looks like Silky is actually maybe their brand since there's a bunch of those, but, and I've never heard of Silky before. <laughs> Silky saws, right? <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, at Dan, uh, we'll try getting the reviews merch. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Appreciate you. Uh, Andy says, uh, you can only have one seller name, correct? So making it specific to one category of products when you're selling in several categories, would that be good? Correct. Yeah, you want it to be generic um, if you have multiple brands. I mean, ours is the name of one of our, it's just the name of our LLC. Like we've never actually changed it. So Tom, maybe we should do that to our parent company name, I guess. But <laughs> it's not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't affect sales. It's not that it's pretty fine print kind of stuff there. So as, as Dan mentioned, um, you know, this isn't, this is an eBay. The seller name doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, the the little top sprinkle on the uh, on the you know, it's nice to have the same some some uh, continuity, right? Um, but stuff like you know your 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 seller reviews and stuff, you obviously want to take care of. But look at this; they have a customer service phone number. <laughs> Let's call them. <laughs> ask a question interesting um but yeah that the uh the name one like we've said a couple times here that you want to kind of generic within your category um but not as important as the brand names facebook uh, user says uh please tell me my uh about product video if we create a product video with the help of product image then is it beneficial for the business or not? I think it's talking about like a slideshow video. 
is using the images. Um, any video is better than no video unless it's a really bad video. <laughs> Yeah, just make sure that your copywriting's good, right? Like if you're going to do, I'll use an industry term like supers, like text over the video or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, I think that's what he's talking about. Yeah, make sure that there's no, you know, broken English or improper grammar or anything like that. You want to make sure that it's it's legit. Um, and as long as you do that, yeah, anything is better than nothing. I mean, the, the only... It's, it's best to shoot video because people are watching your video for a reason. They want to see the product in context. They have some question in their head that the product images have not answered. And if that's the case, if it's just a slideshow of the images that you've already used for the listing, it's not providing any new information. So you could frustrate somebody. But once again, you know, to Jason's point, it's better to have something there than nothing uh, as long as it's professionally done. Um, yeah. so yeah, you could do a slideshow. That's fine. Um, we shoot video for every product we launch, no matter what. Um, and we don't, we don't do slideshows, but that's cause we're very confident in our products. So we, we, we spend the money, but we know not everybody can do that. So for, for product detail page, like Dan said, um, they're watching that video to uh there, there's something missing they need to find out more information um for f for sponsored brands on uh, now and now sponsored display uh video you want something um it's kind of the opposite you need to get their attention and you scroll on i have this on <clears throat> mobile view here and it takes up the whole screen when you get to the video and you've got about two seconds three seconds for them to click on it or they're they're on to the next thing, right? Um, as Dan mentioned, better to have actual live action shots. Uh, I put in bird feeder on this uh, search here, and this is what came up. Um, but if you can't get something like this, let's see if we can find one more. This is kind of a, a middle of the line example of you know having text uh, overlay, but a, a general slideshow is going to be. They've all got some uh, real videos here. So here's here's obviously stock footage. Um, oh, never mind. The, <laughs> the guy is demonstrating how. So this isn't a great sponsored brand ad. This would be more for product detail page. Hey, let's show the durability. Let's show what it looks like in the window. This people have already engaged your product detail page. They want to find out more about the product. The most important things for sponsored brand when you're doing this is to have something in the face in the first two seconds, the first one second, doesn't matter what it is, a flash or orange color or whatever, the product coming up into the face, because um, that's how you're going to gather the attention as 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 the uh, potential uh, consumer or the potential uh, customer um, clicks on your listing. <laughs> um, all right. A couple more questions here, Dan. I know we're we're coming on time here. Uh, size color values are valid for the current category. This is back to that parentage question. I made sure of that in the flat file. How should I tackle this issue? How do I know parents suppress? Go, uh, go into your parent and, and in the back end, and I'll see if I can demonstrate real quick. Sorry, one second. Hamza, you got to book a coaching call with Jason. <laughs> All right. So that's how we met. <laughs> that is uh, yeah. dan and i actually that's not true we met a, in a in a nice talk on linkedin first oh yeah <laughs> i forgot about that i thought I, I was wondering if we were going to bring that up on this call or not let's, <laughs> let's let's leave that we'll see if somebody can find that interaction on linkedin and, and yeah share. you yeah. can probably find dan and, and and myself's first interaction on linkedin um go go to the parent hamza and click edit and if you get an error here, oh my gosh, Amazon has been slow today. If this doesn't pop up, oh, what? What is this? <laughs> there, we have an error. <laughs> um, if this happens, uh, you have a problem. Um, also, the, the one that normally happens, if there's a real big problem in your situation, is you don't see anything here. And it says, this SKU has an inconsistent classification with the uh, the SKU or the parent variation or something like that, and uh, that means the easiest way to fix this because they're supposed to. This is a bug right now on Amazon. 
Uh, it's supposed to update it on the 14th with the, with the next big update. But uh, easiest way to fix that issue right now is just delete the parent, create a brand new uh, parentage. Uh, it fixes it in a couple seconds. Sounds like there's some sort of disconnect on uh, your parentage here. Be sure that it's not uh, suppressed either. Sometimes they'll suppress the parent. Uh, it's missing description or something stupid like that, even though it shouldn't require description. Uh, Joe says to break the reviews when the nodes are different. Yeah, Ooh, it, that could true. be it. Or the, uh, the GL number. Uh, Marlon says thanks a million, guys. That technique was awesome. See, look at you guys, super fans now, Dan. Oh. Uh... We'll look back on this day. <laughs> um, okay, a couple more. Great. Thank you, my Fabi. Uh, Hasib says, can you share a roadmap to someone who's a newbie to PPC? Where should we start? And further steps, which it needs to pay attention. Watch our Tuesday podcast yesterday, uh, every week at 5 Eastern with our advertising director, Matt Davis. We also have hundreds of videos on the My Amazon Guy YouTube on PPC from beginner stuff to advanced stuff. We have magdashschool.com um, where you can learn, again, beginner to uh, advanced uh, techniques on PPC, launching, all that stuff. And it costs less than, as Face always says, costs less than door dashing Taco Bell. <laughs> um, Facebook user says, but if we are doing work remotely for someone of video editing, then what should we do? Because client says that they want the product promo video but we don't have the video. Uh, okay, so he can't. <laughs> they need to hire a pro. <laughs> they need to hire somebody to make the video, or you get a, a slideshow video. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, uh, they're gonna need to send the product to you. If you're trying to do a one man all like all one man shop here, where you're doing like making the video for them as well as doing their. Oh uh, man, unless you have experience, I mean, yeah. Slideshow, uh, there's plenty of people on Fiverr that'll do a slideshow for you for like 10 bucks. Um, one last question here. Osman says, is there any advice for handgun accessory sellers? <laughs> uh, I don't sell handgun accessories, so can't help Steve, you there. Steve I know, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, I know we're, we're getting into some of this stuff. Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, the one main thing with these type of things is you have to be real careful with uh, IP infringement on because handgun accessories are going to be naming um, types of uh, models and weapons and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, as well as trigger keywords for Amazon, like weapon and <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> these uh, type of items often get banned from advertising before they get yanked or anything like that uh, just because of the TOS doesn't mean you can't advertise them you just have to write your copy and uh, make sure everything is within tos on that uh, front one last question here dan and then i have one question about product launch uh, left here for me and then we'll sign off here hamza says just check no issue that whatsoever everything is good and back end when i click on the parent amazon page opens but no variation shows open a ticket uh it sounds like there's a pdp display issue or there's definitely some catalog issue that you can't um uh, without diagnosing this in the back end, I can't, it can be a million things, Hamza, but uh, see what the support says. Ticket the parent, uh, make sure to include the child va variations. Uh, your ticket would be uh, not displaying, parentage not displaying properly on the PDP. Uh, 100%, they're going to tell you to delete it and re upload it. Uh, I'm get, just telling you right now, that's what they're going to say. So, <laughs> uh, Dan, thanks again. I, I, I really, whoops, that's the wrong button. Uh, there we go. I, I really, um, enjoyed our our uh, chat here i had one more question that we didn't cover i know we're going back to product uh launch and, and research and all that but this one always comes up and I, I was i wanted to get your take on on this so you have uh you've identified your product um you've done your research we've got our brand name we've got all that and now this type of product that you're launching um can definitely have a colored variation. Like, um, you know, let's just say black and white uh, or blue or whatever. Um, what What's the process of deciding, you know, uh, on the initial launch, not after uh, adding variations, but on the initial launch, or maybe you just 
maybe you just launch with one color, but um, how do you decide, hey, we're going to go to market with a couple different colors? Um, <clears throat> for color variation specifically, we'll use something like PicFu uh, to just quickly test some Photoshop versions of different colors and stack rank them. Um, there's a thing with variations. You want to have a certain amount of variations because if you do, if you have just two, people may look outside your, um, your listing for, um, other options to, yeah. to, to scratch the itch of having felt like they shopped enough to make a decision. But if you have, I forget what the number is like four to eight variations, like a sweet spot of five or six, then they can scratch that itch of uh, needing to shop by just doing it on, on your listing and looking through those color variations. Yeah. So I would say you want to pick the number of variations you want first and just recognize that there's benefits of having like four or five over two or three, and then use a tool like PicFu to stack rank the colors and look at people's feedback, which is very inexpensive. You can do it on a single image heat map and say, Click which one you like the most, and then people will do that and tell you why, and there's your list. When you do that, it also tells you kind of what your hero skew most likely is going to be. Yeah. So you want to really figure out what you're going to push, where all your keywords are going to live on what listing, on what variation, and that will be that one. And then the other variations will have alternate color type keyword sets and things like that that might be a little bit different. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of our process on how we select what colors we select, because I I've guessed before, I'm like, Ooh, this is a trendy, cool color. And once we run a pick foo for, you know, with a hundred or 200 people, I realized, well, that was just me. Like <laughs> people, don't, people don't like this. So, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't be married to your ideas. Don't be married to your color ideas. Let the, let, let the group of people, um, tell you what it is that they want. Um, instead of guessing. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question in terms of, you know, picking, picking variation colors and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things, uh, like you said, there's a sweet spot. <clears throat> there's definitely people that go overkill. We'll see listings where there's, you know, uh, 20 colors and that's, that's, uh, I call them a, like a bloated parentage and especially on your phone. When you see something that has like 20 variations, you're just like, oh man, like, and then if it's a dual variation, this is what I see a lot, especially with stock issues. You have just so many, so you had 15 colors and then there's also a size variation, small, medium, large or whatever. So you finally pick the color you want, but they don't have the size you want in that color. And then you're just like, I'm over it. I'm going somewhere else. Like, yep. <laughs> yep. hundred percent. I'm always but, looking um, for shoes and I'm just like it drives me crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess shoes would be the best example for shoes. That. Are, <laughs> shoes are a strong example for that, right? You find a color, color way that you like, and then the size isn't there. And then you throw your phone across the room. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, Dan, again, thanks so much, man. Um, uh, had a blast. Always fun talking with you. Uh, and um, if uh, any of you YouTubers out there, need uh, uh help or uh, have any questions you can go to myamazonguy.com i've got coaching here uh for any personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, amazon issues you need assistance with you got steven myself matthew uh francisco and shabon for catalan gangs or anything like that and uh, we also have mag-school.com where you can buy courses and learn about amazon as well as our youtube channel with thousands of videos um including uh this new one which will include the most comprehensive brand uh <laughs> brand selection strategy thanks to dan Pescorse. again dan thank you so much thanks jason appreciate it all right we'll see everyone um stephen pope will be live tomorrow and faith and i will be here live on friday have a wonderful rest of your